This is part of the What Value Culture programme hosted by the Centre for Cultural Value, which is running all of this week and next. My name is Andrew Higson. I'm a professor of film and television at the University of York, and I'm also one of the associate directors of the Centre for Cultural Value. And we're delighted to have such a strong lineup of contributors and so many attendees for this session. I'd like to thank you all for joining us. Before I hand over to the chair of this session, I'd just like to tell you a little bit more about the Centre for Cultural Value and how we hope we can work together with people like yourselves. So the Centre was set up about a year ago. It's based at the University of Leeds, but it's very much a collaborative and national enterprise. We're funded for five years initially by the AHRC, Arts Council England and the Paul Hamlin Foundation. And our mission is to help build a stronger shared understanding of the differences that arts, culture, heritage and the screen industries make to people's lives and to society. In part, this is about ensuring that uh, both cultural practice and cultural policy are based on rigorous research and evidence. We need a much better understanding of how cultural activities create value for different people and different communities, how and why that happens, and in what particular circumstances. And as a centre, we want to work together with and support people like you. If you're involved in cultural practice, we want to help you better evaluate the impact of your work and to enable you to draw on research insights and engage in critical reflection about uh, what you do. If you're involved in policy, we want to ensure you have appropriate evidence about the value of culture to help you make well-informed decisions. And if you're an academic, we want to help provide an appropriate context for engaging with people, with uh, cultural organisations in your research. To this end, the centre is going to be producing a range of research digests, free online resources, funding to support research collaborations and opportunities such as this to discuss questions of cultural value. And we invite you to join us in this collective endeavour to help us better understand the role that culture plays in our lives. I'd now like to introduce Dave O'Brien from the University of Edinburgh, who's going to chair this session. Dave, over to you. Hello and uh, welcome everybody. Thanks for, uh, I guess, tuning in would be the, uh, the, the right term to, uh, to describe this kind of online event. We're hoping um, because we've got this theme around exploring cultural value and participation that we're going to have a bit of uh, participation, both uh, from the excellent panel who I'm going to introduce shortly, um, but also from you um, in the audience. And, and I can see you all um, just um, saying hello and, and saying who you are in, in the chat. Uh, and, and, and obviously we welcome all of you to, to do that. So what we're going to do this afternoon is think through a, a really kind of grand, uh, I think, question um, around cultural participation. And yet it's a grand question that also um, tells us things that happen on the everyday um, and in sometimes uh, quite mundane ways about people's engagement with and participation and thus their valuing of culture. As part of this conversation, uh, we've got an experienced and uh, expert panel to join us. And just before I introduce them and, and hand over to them for some opening remarks, I'm just going to do a little bit of, of housekeeping. Um, we've got a live transcriber. Um, so if you'd like captions, you can just press the uh, closed caption button, which should be at the bottom of your uh, Zoom screen. Um, we are um, kind of encouraging the conversation through social media using the hashtag uh, valuing culture and also uh, tweeting the Centre for Cultural Value as well. Um, we are recording this uh, just uh, to warn you. Um, obviously, um, if you don't want to be seen and, and don't want to be uh, recorded, um, just feel free to turn off your, your camera uh, and your microphone. Um, we won't be sharing uh, the chat publicly. Um, and for the breakout session, I think there's about 150 of you now. Um, if it stays that number for the breakout session, uh, we won't be recording those as well. So you'll have a chance to uh, chat amongst yourselves. I'll say a little bit more about that later. Um, but for now, I'd like to hand over um, to our contributors. Um, I'd like to introduce 
uh, Nish Tandon, who is the founder and chief executive of uh, Art Sector, uh, Amira Sala, who is the general manager of Beat Freaks, Sarah Clark, who is learning and participation manager at the National Civil War Center, the Palace Theater, and Newark Castle, uh, and Zofika Ahmed, uh, who is director of The Leap in Bradford. Um, and I'd like to offer them uh, three minutes or so, uh, I'm gonna be quite strict uh, and time them to give an initial response to this grand question of what might cultural value and participation look like with and post COVID-19. So Nisha, over to you, please. Good afternoon, Dave, and good afternoon, everybody here from sunny Belfast. Um, I've been given this opportunity to talk to you all about um, what might cultural participation look like in post COVID-19. Um, my organization really works with very vulnerable and very vulnerable uh, communities of BAME individual artists and also the uh, BAME organizations um, and also in the very much of an area of deprivation uh, where culture or cultural activities are very, very divided, as you will know the history of, uh, of Northern Ireland. And to bring peace and reconciliation work together through cultural activities, that's what we do. And then that's how we support our individual artists to do that as well. There were a lot of challenges for everybody who works in cultural arts and heritage um, from since March. And we had to really, really think and adapt uh, our artistic approach and engage with the communities in a different ways. And that different ways was that how can we serve our communities who are so, so vulnerable, uh, i.e. the refugee uh, and asylum and also our um, older people. So we started to do some online delivery, but that had already challenges within ourselves that we were not trained enough in our digital side of things. So how do we adapt to that? Um, so we had to retrain not only ourselves, but also our uh, artists and also the organizations who we were uh, asking to be part of our whole program. So, but there are still, there were a lot of challenges and there are still a lot of challenges which we are facing because digital is not everybody's way of uh, working. And we had to uh, look into making more digital strategies um, and working very closely with our local council to see how we can develop that. Um, so that, that was one side of things. And also in terms of the cultural participation, um, which we feel that after um, COVID, post COVID, or during this period now, um, the uh, vulnerable communities just had the very much of a lack of confidence in coming back into the open shared spaces and open spaces or into your own cultural space here. So it, that was another, um, another challenge that how can we really, really support their mental health? So we started to do the delivery boxes um, of uh, arts and cultural packets, which were delivered at their doorstep. And they were starting to do these things at home with step-by-step -step guide. But then that also is not going to give us the confidence to keep bringing, you know, to bring them back. And how do we keep on engaging with them and keep uh, the audience development the way we want to have? And we are very well known for our outreach program. So how can we keep these um, cultural activities uh, alive? And those are the most challenging things which we are thinking at the present moment. And how do we do? So cultural boxes is one of those things which we are now reaching out to most of the schools and most of the other and online things, but that is not our future because we really do not know how to uh, bring everybody together in the space which we really, really want to, though we have uh, thought about it, but again, um, the digital strategies um, is another way of looking forward. And we did do our festival online and we reached our audiences internationally. But 
um, reaching international audiences is bringing Belfast and Northern Ireland to a platform where the travel and tourism, whenever it sort of uh, uh, comes back to its normality, the economic benefit will be it. But just at the pre present moment, what we can do. So my challenge is that we should look into the cultural cities inquiry and also look into the cultural uh, compact programs where the leadership investment and talent and place is so, so important. Thank you. My three minutes are over. Um, oh, oh dear. No, don't worry. That, that was an excellent start and lots and lots of things uh, to think about, lots of, lots of practical examples as well as challenges. Um, so, uh, Amira, would you like to, to go next? Yes, thank you, um, Dave. Um, hi, my name's Amira Saleh. Um, I'm a general manager at Beat Freaks, um, spelt with a double E, so it says Be Free in the middle. Uh, we are an insight and research agency. We work with brands, governments and funders who see value in sharing power with young people. So we're all about distributing power in young people who are not just the leaders in the future, but leaders now and have a lot to say. We offer insight and youth engagement to unleash the creativity of young people, meaning they get more opportunities, networks and power. But in return, the businesses and policymakers stay relevant with incredible diverse talent, ideas and innovation. Our most recent work has been the Take the Temperature report, which worked on the impact of coronavirus on young people across the UK. And the work that we do essentially is all about working with organisations to find solutions to uh, problems and or as we like to call them challenges we thrive in um, and work with young people to make sure that that they are best represented take the temperature is one of the one of the pieces of research that we release kind of free and it's it's uh, something that we enjoy kind of making and creating and offering it back to the public to say here is young people that we've spoken to around the country. So we think we spoke to about 2000, maybe just under uh, young people uh, in March around what does coronavirus mean for them and how does it impact them? So that's a free report to download. It's a very interesting question that we pose. Um, and I'd like to start with a post COVID world doesn't exist yet. Um, and we don't know what post COVID means. So it's a very hard, um, think to start thinking about and I think actually particularly in the cultural sector we tend to go okay what's the future but actually we forget about the now and what we're doing now and how we should respond one of our biggest learnings has been this idea of FOMO and this idea of the fear of missing out has been a huge um, marketing tool by accident that people are allowed to go so when you localize culture that you go and you hear about it in the grapevine or through your friends, you're like, oh yeah, I'm gonna to go to that because it's only popping here for now. Whereas now digital has catalysted what culture means. You not only consume it around you, but you can consume it from anywhere in the world. Pre recording and having stuff online for a longer period of time also means I don't have to catch it in that moment. It's not gonna be, if I miss it now, I'm never gonna see it again. So we have allowed this opportunity, as I like to call it in terms of giving space for culture to be way more than just in an institution or in a building or in a space it has become uh, an, an element of TikTok. It, you know it, it it's become it as part of our daily lives and young people's daily lives of consuming that whether they actively are aware of it or not i feel like the biggest thing that that is a is a challenge that we should be talking about and thinking about is how we market culture and cultural activity because it's now become how does tech enable our activity and actually what does that mean on the biggest scale in for digital poverty and access to young people that are in the most deprived communities that can't access a, a wi-fi connection or and um, that that can't sustain or have a uh, one of the biggest learnings is young people's home environments. I mean, we're all in each other's living rooms, which is, is a very weird space. So I think, yeah, a big, a big question for me would be, how does tech enable more people to see this? And also what does it mean for digital poverty? Thank you. That's, re that's really great. And a, a really interesting combination, I guess, of the, the practical challenges, um, but also, I mean, the incredible potential um, 
both for you know delivering culture but also potentially for kind of revolutionizing institutions and, and really um, I was really struck actually by you, your use of the word power really early on um, and, and that'll be something we, we might pick up on later um, but for now we've still got to really um, interesting speakers to go as our opening statement. So, um, Sarah, if you'd like to go next. Hi. Um, so we were asked to reflect on what we've learned over the last few months. Like a lot of small museums and small theatres out there, the first thing we learned was that we weren't ready. Um, our website was limited, our digital skills were sadly lacking, and our community relationships were really underdeveloped. Um, but we had a fabulously creative team of people who were on the case and they were able to react quickly. We got in touch with schools and families to provide home learning schemes of work. We started a community knitting project that we've been wanting to do for ages and we ran the district's food distribution hub from our stage. We made use of some of the great digital training which was available and we've learned how to create our own films with subtitles how to make stop motion animation, create and market podcasts. I even, and I'm showing my age here, attended a course about how to use TikTok. I mean, my children don't need a course to do that, but I did. Uh, but it enabled us to run the big draw in an alternative way this year when we couldn't get out and about with a crowd of people and a bunch of pencils. By the summer, it was looking like this wasn't going to be over anytime soon. So we needed to find funding to help us adapt to the with COVID world. I knew that we needed to come up with a solution for schools, which would mean that we could still offer an excellent service regardless of what COVID threw at us. Um, so a lot of emergency funding streams weren't open to us as we're a local authority funded service. So I was starting to tear my hair out when I discovered the Art Funds Respond and Reimagine grants. When I was a primary school teacher, I never tired of explaining to children and their adults that problem solving isn't just for maths lessons. Creative people are great problem solvers because we can see things in interesting ways. And what I loved about the Respond and Reimagine Fund is that it was open and flexible. So it allowed for experimentation. Sometimes experiments go the way you hope and sometimes they don't, but I think that's okay and they're always worth the risk. So we were granted 40,000 pounds to rethink our approach to formal education, which to us is untold riches. We are so pleased to have had this opportunity to pause and take stock, even though it were difficult times. We've worked out a package that includes on-site visits, in-school visits, a new generation of loans and online activity, both live and recorded. And we're in the process of creating and piloting parts of that at the moment. We've listened to our audiences, looked again at the curriculum, identified what we do best and started afresh. A blended approach to learning is what's going to enable us to be responsive and continue to provide high quality experiences for learners on any platform. I feel that the key lessons that we as a sector can learn from our experiences in 2020 are these. Firstly, be flexible. Never be afraid to adapt and learn from experiences. And that applies across the sector from funders and board members to strategic planners to front of house staff and facilitators. And two, value the views and the needs of our audiences. We're not here to deliver culture, art and heritage that we think people need to see. What do our audiences want to participate in? Um, it's our duty and our privilege to find ways to help them to do that. So what might cultural participation look like in the future? Let's be positive. I hope it will be flexible, open and listening. Thanks. Perfect. Um, I just clocked another uh, another mention for TikTok there, which um, again we, we we might come back to because uh, I think platforms are particularly interesting um, in this context, both what they enable and, and then maybe actually what they uh, what they shut down or, or maybe what the uh, the trade offs are. Um, just before um, I hand over um, to our final speaker, I'd just like to flag the process um, for the, the middle of this session. Uh, we've got 166 of you, which is brilliant. Um, and we're going to have a bit of a Q&A, a bit of a discussion, which hopefully is going to be driven by you, the participants, by uh, throwing comments or questions into the chat. Um, I'll be kind of monitoring the chat, you know, picking up on um, particular themes that are coming up. Um, hopefully I'll try and bring you in to ask your questions if the tech um, allows. That's one. Uh, two is uh, we set up uh, breakout rooms uh, where we'd like you to do a little bit of kind of 
uh, networking and a little bit of consideration. We've got a broad question about what people have learned from delivering and engaging in cultural participation, uh, what people might do uh, differently, you know, both in the now and as the, uh, the kind of the next stages of the pandemic develop. I'll say a bit more about how that's going to work um, after we've heard um, from our final expert witness, uh, Zulfikar Ahmed, who is from The Leap. Thanks, Dave. Um, so I would suggest that there are perhaps three key cultural shifts that present strategic challenges and opportunities for culture uh, and cultural organisations during and post the COVID pandemic. Um, the first is a shift in personal values. So personal values reflect uh, what matters to us most as individuals and have a major impact on the way that we behave and participate in cultural life. So when life conditions change as they have, it can often cause people to shift their values and reevaluate their priorities. We've seen this shift in personal values take place uh, because of the pandemic. Um, I would say we've hardly seen four personal values emerge uh, in priority during this pandemic. And, I'd say these are making a difference, uh, adaptability, well-being and caring. Uh, there's evidence too that the values of continuous learning and family that were already present pre-COVID have since increased in priority for most people, uh, as people have found more time uh, to devote to themselves and their family and friends. Um, so the shift in priorities, prioritising these values, I would say, reflects the need that people are feeling to take care uh, of themselves and one another. Uh, and that's a, a major cultural shift. Um, um, overall, what I'd say is that this may present an a major opportunity to scale up and reach uh, to people that may not have been previously engaged in culture and for cultural organisations to provide the ideas, creative tools and resources communities need uh, to embed these values into their lives on an ongoing basis and you know, into the future. My second reflection is around who drives culture, or to put it another way, uh, where ownership for, for producing and sharing culture lies. Um, producing culture has largely been a specialist activity which has mostly been left to artists and cultural organisations. And most people pre-COVID were um, likely to be passive recipients of culture uh, rather than producers. So with COVID we've seen the emergence of many hundreds of examples of artistic and creative efforts led by individuals and groups of people who prior to COVID might not have had the motivation to create opportunities for others to get involved in culture uh, or cultural activity. I think this is a really exciting development uh, and it has huge potential post-COVID if the energy and momentum for community-led culture can be harnessed and supported by the cultural sector post-COVID. Um, and I think there's a, a real opportunity for the cultural sector to, uh, to lean into that space uh, as people are more kind of alive to being leaders in their places. Um, and the third, my final area is around collaboration and partnerships. Uh, so the pandemic has created a, a problem that's far too complicated for any one agency or sector to respond to on its own. Um, uh, and that's led to uh, the creation of alliances that may have been unlikely or taken huge amounts of energy to convene prior to the pandemic. Uh, for example, in Bradford, we've seen arts and cultural organisations, food banks, statutory service and voluntary, voluntary groups come together and package up their various service offerings for people most in need and deploy them in unison, which has been incredible to see. Uh, and interestingly, funders um, who can be somewhat uh, at times slow to, uh, to respond to need have worked alongside that energy in, at great speed. Um, and talking about platforms, we've seen Facebook um, used widely as an organising tool to manage supply and demand in many cases. And that's been pretty incredible to see too. So what we've learned is that collaboration at speed is possible uh, and that we now have many innovative models that may hopefully continue post-COVID. Uh, and that may offer the creative sector uh, direct reach to audiences that may have been not so easy to reach in the past. Uh, I think that's my three minutes there, Rabs. Perfect. Um, there's a couple of questions uh, or a couple of comments in the chat, um, and I'm, I'm maybe going to summarise them just um, to, to follow up with a couple of things you've said. And I think to come back directly to what you were saying about uh, what we might think of as, I guess, a new model of collaboration and partnership, particularly actually between statutory services and um, arts organisations doing things that maybe, I mean, maybe the leap was in this space for a long time, but, you know, perhaps uh, traditionally arts organisations might not have thought of doing. Do you think this will stick? You know, did, do you think this is a, a kind of a, a major change for the leap? that's going to change your practice? Or is it very much a kind of, you know, a 2020 
emergency response that might wither, that might stop, there might be a business as usual. To, to what extent do you think there's going to be a, a kind of a longer term organisational change? Um, I think the, the momentum is there. And I talk about that as being a strategic opportunity because I, be, I believe it is and what we're learning is that if we want to create impact for communities, um, then communities need often have multiple needs um, and culture is one of those needs. We need to fulfill that for people to have fulfilled lives. But those people that have um, very low take up of culture also have many other things that they need. Uh, and what we're finding in the pandemic is that you can package up um, support for the various needs that people have um, and integrate those through different services coming together to provide that thing as a single kind of port of entry and that's really powerful um, so I'd hope that you know that way of working would continue post-COVID and I can't see any reason why it wouldn't because it offers efficiencies uh, and in the analysis it offers great impact for people so my sense is that it would it would um, it, it would kind of continue I, I want to sort of take that on uh, and, and pick up on uh, Damien McGlynn's uh, point about the difference between kind of audiences and, and participation, which, which um, I, I think is, is is important in lots of different ways. And and it it, it makes me think of what, what you were saying, Amira, about, you know, the rise of kind of new modes of cultural production. And to what extent do you think they will have a longer term effect? You know, so, so the TikTok example, I think, is fascinating because um, thinking about the way responses to the pandemic, not just for younger people, but, you know, across um, contemporary society reported was this explosion of everybody is a producer. You know, ev everybody is is kind of responding digitally. Everybody is uh, whether you'd call it, you know, has become a prosumer or, or whatever kind of language we want. But then, you know. There aren't really efficiencies um, to pick up on um, that that point of you know TikTok or, or YouTube or, or new kinds of production. It isn't just a, you know we can save the council or the arts council money uh, with these new modes. So, so to what extent do you think this uh, kind of new form of cultural production is going to stick with us and get the same kind of status as going to an institution or you know having um, an institution produce something? For me, yeah, um, <clears throat> I think that's actually a really, a really interesting question because I think culture has to be responsive, and it, it's how you stay relevant and move with the times. And a lot of, uh, um, I talk more about physical space. It, you're we're not we're not creating that engagement and that participation with our audiences. But what we should be asking is: is it relevant to their lives, and is it relevant to the the people that live in this community. I think, uh, in short, I don't think they're gonna stick. I absolutely, and I fundamentally believe that. I don't think something like TikTok is gonna stick around as much as like Birmingham Museum and Art Gallery has been around. It's just not the same. However, what I do think is that the idea of, for example, influencers and online influencers, everybody, and it's a value we hold at Beat Freaks is, we don't talk about art as, as, a, as a thing. We talk about creativity as a, a, a mindset and to be creative, the influencers that, that have been escalating online and, and going viral for years now have been able to maintain and sustain work being creative. But what we don't do as institutions is we don't value that as the same as going into a museum or as the, the same as consuming a piece of cultural activity outside. And that's where our mindset definitely needs to move is we need to value a TikTok content creator just as much as we value a curator of an exhibition. I, I mean, this prompts um, a really obvious question for, for both uh, Nisha and, and Sarah, I, I guess, who have got slightly more, um, you know, formal uh, institutional uh, perspectives. And, and maybe, Sarah, you, you might go first. Um, uh, I mean, this sounds a bit like kind of news night, doesn't it? You know, but are you valuing TikTok creators? Uh, you know, how has your kind of experience of, you know, learning how to use these mediums of precisely actually asking that question about what do audiences want? Um, how, how has it changed the organisation? That's a really good point. I think um, 
It's, it's tricky for us. We are um, a fairly old school organisation. It's not an old museum, but the theatre is 100 years old. The castle, obviously, a lot older. <laughs> um, and our ways of doing things are fairly traditional. Like I said, we're all local authority funded. And um, in order to make changes stick, um, we have to get um, approval from council members. And, you know, we live and work in a small town in rural Nottinghamshire. It's not easy to make radical change happen quickly. Um, I am doing my best at the moment and, and my team uh, across heritage and culture for the council. We're working very hard to drive that kind of organizational change from a grassroots level. So we're working with our communities, um, starting small, and encouraging our communities to participate in as many ways as possible and encouraging them to help us to persuade the right people that this is a way forward for us. Unfortunately, because councils, of course, are really strapped for cash right now, um, you, you know, we're, heritage and culture is up against bin collection and um, benefits and all those kind of essentials in people's lives. And a lot of people just don't see that culture is an essential in their life. So we are really working hard with our communities on the idea of well-being and how important culture is to helping people um, make new friends, to helping people um, open their um, horizons, to be to aspire to new things and to find new ways of working in this new world. So we're we're working, as I say, grassroots in order to try and uh, encourage organisational change at a higher level. So it's still very early days for us yet. I mean, a, a similar question to you, Nisha, I, I guess um, that idea of art boxes, art packages, um, is that something that was, uh, I guess, embraced by, um, you know, the kind of policy context? Um, were you able to speak to possible funders and kind of say, this is our new model, you know, we think it's great, you should embrace it? Or I, I guess are people kind of, you know, expecting well, this will all stop as soon as normal, whatever that might be, returns. Uh, yeah, it was, uh, in our case, uh, it was that we needed to feed and we needed to bring the cultural side of things to the very vulnerable um, for their mental uh, well-being. So we had to change and we had to think quickly, how can we do that? Because everybody is not digital savvy you know everybody doesn't know how to do digital things so we had to really really go out down to the grassroots levels as what sarah has just said and to be out there in our communities to help and supporting them so arts boxes were the things which i could see because not only that we were also delivering food parcels medicines and all those so we had to change our way of working and that was just only the side one thing of side thing of doing it but I think our future is not going to be about cultural boxes. It is going to be uh, to be really, really changing the citywide policies and citywide way of working and creating those spaces that even a small amount of people could come together and learn from each other. Because I find that the value of culture is more whenever they are learning from each other than to be going um, in, in a box and learning it in your own individual home. So I think it is very, very important that the policymakers should understand that citywide digital strategies are needed. But yes, if you have a huge big uh, festivals or events, which also went all digital side of things and bringing more international audiences uh, into the in, in, in front of Belfast or, or in front of tourism and giving that economic impact for later on. So I think that is also needed. So there's a two sides of, uh, of our story here. Um, but for me, the communities who we are working with, um, it is going to be more the shared spaces and also uh, giving them the room and space and the value of the culture in their own uh, ways, yeah. We've, we've just had a comment picking up on, on that directly, actually, from Jessica White talking about how um, artists, when they're working, you know, digitally, many of them have been saying that they're missing being in a space with people, you know, the sense of kind of magic conversations, that kind of thing. 
and and in some ways you know we're, we're not going to be able to do that physically but the next part of the session is is hopefully going to allow you to do a little bit of that so i'm just going to hand over to uh, adam uh, from the center for cultural value who's going to talk through um, how our breakout rooms are going to work Hi everyone, so we're now going to have a quick self-facilitated breakout session. These are only going to be 10 minutes long, so it's quite quick. So the focus is on an opportunity for some quick fire networking and a chance to get a sense of what others in the sector are saying. So after the breakout group, there'll be lots more discussion and Q&A with the speakers and the rest of the um, attendees for the session. Loads and loads of, of, of really interesting comments and uh, perspectives. Um, I'll just maybe pick out a few of them uh, that seems to be coming through. I mean, it, it strikes me that one thing that's come through is that the challenge of this should not be uh, underestimated. Um, and I think it's it's really important that, um, you know, we're celebrating in, in many ways um, the way organisations and, and individuals have, have risen to the challenge. But... Um, yeah, you know, Le Le Leanne here is saying, you know, there was this kind of sense of unpreparedness. Uh, much earlier, Jenny was talking about how we need, you know, lots and lots of management. Often there was an underestimation of what's possible. Um, then also, I, I, I guess there's, you know, a broader sort of set of questions about digital. Um, and obviously, you know, our, our focus isn't solely um, on digital, but... Um, our four panelists have, have brought digital ways of, of working um, and also, you know, it, it's coming through quite strongly um, in these comments. Um, and that's not just a kind of, you know, um, a question of things like digital poverty. Uh, Judy Brown raised this, um, you know, just how kind of difficult it was uh, to get an understanding of participants' needs um, and, you know, how uh, individuals might not want to um, ask, you know, for specific help or, or raise, you know, uh, questions about barriers that they're facing. Um, and I guess that's that's something that maybe quite a lot of people are, are aware of, that kind of issue. But also on top of that, um, co coming through has, has been this question about how artists and practitioners themselves, you know, are, are kind of responding, um, whether it's a question of... Um, you know, maybe finding it difficult to, to shift their practice um, to, to, to digital uh, spaces and digital modes uh, of engagement. Um, or, you know, whether it's a, a kind of a more uh, general um, question about whether um, these uh, types of uh, platforms and modes of engagement are really appropriate at all for particular practices. Uh, and again, thinking back to um, the earlier um, part of this session um, and that comment about, you know, the need to kind of come together, uh, the need to be physically present and, and, and Nisha's comment about trying to find, you know, even if it's smaller, uh, socially distanced uh, spaces in, in order to, uh, to kind of have that sense of conviviality and, um, and, and coming together. Um, I mean, there's, there's lots of echoes of things that were said um, in, in the opening part of the session, lots of uh, comments that are um, sort of uh, bringing us back to things like, uh, as Sarah had said and, and, and Sally has picked up, about, you know, the importance of uh, people and places, partnerships being really uh, crucial, um, you know, the, the things that have been most successful were um, community development organisations that maybe already had relationships and partnerships that were meant to uh, um, to be you know kind of built on um, and uh, and developed. Um, I'm just going to throw it over um, to the panel. I, I won't sort of pick on uh, any of you. I'll, I'll sort of leave it open for you um, to respond. Um, but are there any uh, kind of bits of feedback from your own groups or, or stuff that's come through in the chat that you find particularly interesting? Um, I think Kathleen raises a really um, uh, important point in the chat. Um, and just to read it out, it says, to me, there is an elephant in the room here in this discussion. How can we really talk about cultural value during COVID and post COVID and not place equal value to the impactful events of the pandemic? and the endemic of racism around George Floyd and Black Lives Matter, aren't these in, in, inextricably linked 
to the call and need for the change we require in culture, the arts, how, why, and who participates, etc. I think it's, yeah, like it's something that is um, earlier. I think Dave, you were talking about um, kind of the the importance of of the arts and culture, and I think we we have to be talking if if we can't change now, and when we've had six and potentially 12 or however many months to to reflect and to look outside our own lives and beyond who we are as people and if we can't make a change then and and now it's it feels like this is the chance where we can't go back to a um, cultural sector that is thinking the same as it was before covid particularly around equality. Can I ask before um, bringing the rest of the panel in, would you say you're, you're optimistic, you're um, pessimistic at, at, at this point about that kind of change in the sector? Um, Dave, can I come in here? Oh, yeah, of yeah. course, yeah. yeah. Um, uh, I really like that question and I, I remember yesterday as well we were talking about this type of work and from for my perspective in Northern Ireland, um, our cultural activities from uh, Black, Asian, minority ethnic groups have never been actually recognized the way it should be recognized at the policy level and at many other levels. Uh, we are still struggling um, to make sure that all our small ways of contributions which we are making to this beautiful part of uh, country is being recognized. Um, so I think maybe now is the time whenever they see what we have achieved within that six months or seven months of lockdown by still going very strong with our arts and culture and heritage type of uh, activities. I think uh, where BAME and the very vulnerable communities are concerned, I think it, at the policy level, they should be listening to us and should be making those changes now um, and, uh, and to be giving better future for our very vulnerable groups. And that whenever I say vulnerable group, I mean disability, I mean LGBT, I mean all those other uh, groups who are very vulnerable as well. And peace and reconciliation work is going on and it still is going on and arts play a very important role in it. Arts and culture plays a very important role in it. But come Brexit, what is going to happen? Um, so it is very important that that importance should be given and there should be strategies move forward uh, to look into more diverse way of working. Especially I'm talking from Northern Ireland context. Yeah, go for it, yeah. Um, I'd say it's a very good question and one that's present in everyone's mind and as we kind of wait for the outcome of the US elections um, and the future impacts of whatever might happen there, um, I think the mind kind of focuses a bit more. Um, I think the question around well, how we respond to a, a global movement around greater equality for all people is very important, but in the mix of that uh, and in the Bradford context, I think it's very easy to say this is about minority ethnic communities and it is a lot of it. But it's also about working class farm, uh, communities as well. What we see in Bradford is that the issue is less around race, it's more around class. And um, what are traditionally called white working class communities or minority ethnic or BME communities suffer similar sorts of disadvantage. And it's easy to create a them in a situation by leaning into one of, the, one of the other. So my sense is the experience from Bradford and uh, other places might be that um, it's a class issue more than a race issue. Although there are, of course, you know, very particular things about um, certain minority ethnic communities that mean that we have to focus particular sorts of attention on them as well. Oh yes, yeah, Sarah. Um, so if I might add to that, I would I would agree with that. Um, particularly in our area, it's it's not an area of great diversity. As I say, we're a rural community. Um, however, I think so. I think the class issue is perhaps for us a bigger point. But it's been very interesting over the last few months for us when I've been keeping an eye on social media and the local press. Um, people have been a lot more open to those from um, 
uh, more minority communities. So for example, there was a great big thing in the press over the last couple of months near here about the um, gypsy and traveler community. Um, moving around trying to find um, new homes uh, during flooding. And actually what we found is that through the pandemic, people have become more open and more welcoming to what has been actually a very well-established um, traveler community in this area. But until recently, they have been very much marginalized. So I think it's quite encouraging to see the improvements for that community through the pandemic because of all this talk about people working together. Uh, and I would say the same thing for the Syrian people in our community, the refugee population, um, who have become much more part of our local community throughout the pandemic. Has the arts played a role in that? Has, has your um, set of cultural organisations been able to play a role in that um, change? There has been a small amount of it, um, not so much from us, because as I said, we're, we're classed very much or considered very much the traditional sort of venue so we've done things like food parcels we've delivered um culture a little bit like Nisha but not I think on such a great scale delivering little um packages of arts materials and things to people's homes um but we've tended to go more through schools and young people um in order to work with a variety of people within our community rather than taking pockets uh of people and therefore dividing them further I'd, I'd like to continue with, with this thread, actually, because it, it's uh, generated a bit of uh, discussion in the chat. And, and I guess it's something that, um, coming back to you, Amira, because you um, spotted that point initially, what kind of things do you think we need to do to ensure that that kind of, um, I think not just the community, um, and local level, but actually, you know, at kind of governmental level, that recognition of the importance of Black Lives Matter actually sticks. You know, it, the BBC gave a response, Sky and Sky Arts talked about, you know, funding um, commissions, you know, put, putting money into developing new talent stuff um, like that. So what kind of things do you, do you think we need to be doing to, to make this stick? I think it's... I, I think it's organisations confronting the biases and privileges and looking around their team and ask, actually asking the questions, are we representative of where we are? Are we the right people to be running these projects? Can we work with partners? Can we bring in some consultants that work with this? I think that on a on an organisational level, is not a big thing and we make it out like it is a huge cost and it's but it it's not in the grand scheme of things when we are so quick to put out statements on our twitters and our social medias to say we stand in solidarity with black lives matter but we're not doing anything in the organization and we always talk about this in beat freaks in terms of and i'm very aware like you know it's it's not my place to say it but from an organization that that ensured that we'd responded and and allowed young people in our community commissions and paid them to create responses in terms of how they wanted it to be voiced and how they wanted it to be talked about rather than go we're going to put this statement out and that's it it's done we look good publicly actually why are we not turning around to each other and holding each other accountable if we're all in this same fight for solidarity for for any but in this particular moment and it's also important to say that the question was around Black Lives Matter and George Floyd so if we can talk about marginalized communities absolutely but the question that was referenced and, and it is important that when we talk about one subject matter we're not bulking them all together because they're very different as well they're all very very different. Yeah I mean I, I was really struck by exactly the process you, you've described with organizations that have a rather checkered history um around who they uh, commission how they exhibit what they you know uh put put on on stage or, or on page rushing to give you know very kind of explicit and, and specific statements in response to george floyd's death whilst at the same time giving no sense of organizational change whatsoever we don't have to name names we, we are being recorded but you know it, it, it's really as as much as the sort of 
the promises of things like commissioning from, from larger organisations, there's still, I think you're, you're completely correct, that sense of where was the moment of listening engagement that fed into uh, an organisational statement. Um, I've got a couple of questions lined up, but just before that, um, does anybody else want to come in on, on that point? Oh, Sarah, yep. Yeah. Um, I just want to um, echo Amira's point about about um, partnership working, because I think you're absolutely right about that, that um, we don't have all the answers within our organisations and we have to recognise that. Um, we did not put out a statement of the kind that you're describing because we didn't feel that we were in a position to do so. Um, but what we've done instead behind the scenes is work with um, a, a, a selection of partners to try and do some research on the lives of black soldiers during the Civil War, the British Civil War. Um, and that's gonna take us a long time to actually get that research because the research doesn't exist. So we're trying to do a piece of work around it so that we can actually make a statement from a point of knowledge rather than as a reaction to anything. And I think you're absolutely right. We've got to work with the people that actually understand the points before we say anything. I'm, I'm just gonna try and uh, bring in uh, a, a comment now, a, a question. Um, so hopefully the tech people are ready. Um, so Sophia uh, Brazio, I, th I think it is how you pronounce it, uh, has raised a really interesting um, point um, that didn't, uh, she says she didn't have a chance to, to discuss in the breakout room. So if, if you're sort of up for it, Sophia, uh, and the tech people can, can highlight you, it'd be great if you could ask your question to the panel. Yeah, so hiya. Um, so as I said in my question, I've done research during the pandemic around how this sort of new situation um, has represented a chance for disabled people to get more involved both in culture reduction and access to, to culture, so consumption. Um, and what I found was that there was a widened participation in general and that many disabled creatives were also allowed um, sort of career progression because the online space removed the barriers that disabled people usually encounter um, in cultural spaces, whether that be physical barriers or discrimination. And um, so this has been a good thing. But my question is, again, we need to consider the intersectionality. So how can we make sure that everyone has access to this new form of online culture when access online requires access to technology? And we know that not everyone has that. Would anyone like to uh, step forward to answer that? Or does anyone have any reflections on, on actually um, that, that kind of work? No. <laughs> can I can I just say this is exactly a question that we've been struggling with. Okay. Um, I I am trying to um, work on how to do some consultation with our community without using computers or smartphones or whatever. And all I can come up with at the moment is for me and my colleagues to be walking around the town or standing in the marketplace with a market stall and talking to people. Um, you know, the market, we're lucky, we're a small market town, we've still got a, a functioning market. So I could actually be out there three times a week talking to people. And I think that is really the only way I can come up with at the moment in which I can meet face to face with people while our museum and theatre are closed. Is it something that um, you're struggling with at, at the Leap? Um, does the Leap have, I guess, uh, um, a more kind of you know direct uh, relationship in terms of people's use of space. I, I can imagine um, not just in, in terms of uh, people's ability to enter a, a castle or a theatre, um, that you know, but also the kind of uh, rural uh, setting might have particular and, and unique issues. But but what what about in Bradford? The, the link focuses particularly on uh, inner city wards with high. Of um, density of population and um, a very low engagement in culture traditionally. 
Um, the, I mean, the area is characterised by having low levels of um, kind of take up the technology broadly. And so the decision that we took very early on about online was that it just wasn't relevant to those people um, because they weren't accessing much by way of culture anyway. Um, very few had um, kind of access to tech. And so um, trying to do that, trying to engage them in culture uh, through technology would have meant a lot of time and a huge amount of money, but with very little impact. Um, and instead, what we decided to do was work with other partners who were delivering more direct sorts of um, provision to people's door. And that for us felt to us to be a much better use of resources than you know trying to do something that we, that it might have been a useful experiment, but our sense was that it just wasn't valuable. And so uh, we just didn't do it. Fair enough. Um, and it, it's interesting to hear actually that kind of look this isn't working, you know, it, it, it's not for us. Um, th th there's a specific point to pick up on what Sarah was saying um, about, are you doing this in a kind of organized manner? You know, have you got a sort of, I guess, you know, it's Saturday afternoon, pre-lockdown pre too, we know people are at the shops, we'll set up, you know, um, in, in a physical space to talk people, or is it more kind of ad hoc? At the moment, it's ad hoc, um, but that's because we've been open until today. Um, now that the museum and, and all our sites are closed again um, and our staff are not furloughed, um, we are going to be out um, at least twice a week and taking some form of cultural activity with us. And we don't know what that will be just yet. We've got to work on that plan. Um, so it's, But it's also going to be used as a as a consultation exercise for us to be actually talking to people, what kind of cultural participation are you interested in? What cultural media are you interested in? Are you, do, you want, do you want more music? Do you want more theater? Do you want us to put on performances that you can see in alternative ways? It's really about asking questions to find out what people want from us in terms of culture within the district. So we'll, we'll just take some fun things to do. Um, that can be socially distanced and outdoors in order for us to be able to start those conversations. Ooh, muted there, sorry. Uh, I wonder if we could spotlight uh, Damien McGlynn, um, who, who's got a, a question about wider social shifts and, and, it, and it picks uh, up on, on Ricky's point about uh, the kind of une uneven distribution um, of resources in society. So if the tech team uh, I could spot spotlight Damien, and if I they... can wave or sing a song, and oh, wonderful! Find... Yeah, <laughs> uh, could, could you ask your question? Thanks. Uh, you've probably already articulated it better than me, Dave. Uh, that's what I was hoping you might do. But yeah, I was just thinking about the kind of the main question of of this session being um, kind of with and post COVID, and I think it was Amira who said earlier, <laughs> imagining the kind of post COVID is is extremely difficult. We don't know when that point is going to come. But what we have seen, and I mentioned just some of the stuff that has come up, some of the rethinking that's gone on with some really big topics and questions and, and the whole issue of digital exclusion, uh, about racism uh, within, within the sector, all of these things have been talked about. But there's also just, I think, this big shift in how people are going to live their lives in the near future and the things that they're going to prioritize. There's been a lot of realizations for people what, what is important there's a lot of talk about a shift away from urban living, uh, the desire to live near a city centre, uh, big office blocks. These could slowly be phased out in the, in the next while. So if, if people are maybe going to have a, a rebalancing of how they spend their time, maybe living more rurally or sub in suburban areas and just living and working in the same place, that, that has a knock-on effect for how the cultural sector that we've all known in the previous few decades is going to operate. So thinking particularly, I guess, about the idea of cultural participation, if things become maybe more decentralized in the way we live, how does that affect things? But equally, if, if offices and businesses start vacating city centers, does that open opportunities for spaces uh, and, and creative participation, I guess, within those uh, <laughs> slightly abandoned spaces in cities, I guess. I, I wonder if, if I could ask Amira to come in on, on that one, because you, you mentioned specifically the kind of, you know, going beyond institutions and going beyond physical spaces. Um, 
And that's a really interesting kind of question, isn't it? If the sorts of trends that we're seeing, at least the kind of media reporting about people don't want to be in the city centre, they don't want to be commuting to work. Organisations are saying, you know, you don't have to commute. Or is, is this maybe, you know, something a bit more temporary? I think, I think it, it, it's really interesting. I'd like to start this off with, um, it, feel, it feels very big now with all the conversations that were happening, but it's also important to say that uh, these are big conversations for a lot of people. The only thing that the pandemic has done is made a lot of people with privilege who they could that could be ignored is it just it we all faced it directly and I think it, it's important to because there's been a lot of work and we can't just come in now and all go oh this is a really big thing let's all solve it because there's been years of work that you know black people have doing LGBTQ plus people have been doing disabled people that that work has been and they've been trying to fight that justice for a long time I think it's it's really interesting when you're talking about space because in Beat Freaks at the moment we're re we're going through a cultural reimagined series of workshops in terms of what does Beat Freaks even look like um, because we're not in the office physically and our culture is very much around each other like we are like a big family we help each other move houses like because we're so close together and the global pandemic has put us all on like a screen and gone now you still have to have that same relationship and it's been very weird so we're talking about what does it look like to be a flexible and I think when you're talking about how does this impact our lives is there there's there's been a lot in terms of like traditional traditional and and I don't like to use the word traditional because I think we use it as an excuse to not change but actually it's it's we we, we can everyone can and I think an element of we've been you know, you have to go into a museum or you have to go to, uh, you know, to, to the office at Network Rail and, and that's what you have to do. And it's been a norm that you have to do it. And then COVID hit and everyone went, oh, actually, you can do this from home and it's been OK. And the access there that it breaks is that you can be a parent and and work and juggle it around. And, you know, Sarah earlier said, you know, my, my kids might come home from school halfway. You you can do that now. And I think that is beautiful. Like you know, we've had dog, dogs bark in the middle of meetings and we've just become more human, I think. And, and it's been a beautiful uh, way to, to say we're not we're not robots and, and we don't live to just work. It's not it's not what we want to do. We want to have that balance. So to to look at space differently, I think this is the perfect time because you're now in my home, which is also my office. And but then you remove that into an abandoned building in, for example, Birmingham City Council, we have, I think we own like 60% of parks in, in the city, like very beautiful. We're like West Midlands meant to be the greenest city, just as to the greenest area. And, and it's like, it's beautiful. And we've got so many parks, but have, were they ever used apart from like the big mellas that happened or the fun fairs? No, but now we're starting to look at that and go, oh, there's a big empty green patch we could do something socially distance. And I think to use space outside of your institution and outside of your building and actually to go, you know, Birmingham Rep Theatre sits in the city centre, but we're gonna go over to Ladywood and we're gonna just do a theatre production in the park and breaking how it is seen by a community is, is what, what we're gonna be able, given that we get the permissions that we can and, and the councils and the policymakers can all come on board with that. Um, Zofika, you, you want to make a point? Yes, yeah, so I really love that, Amira. Um, I love that kind of scope of it. I think there's a, a really good opportunity here to think about what we mean by culture uh, and who defines that. So one of the things that struck me um, looking, so I'm very new to the creative sector, I've only been in this space for about six or seven months, um, having come from enterprise entrepreneurship, was the data that we use to decide what culture is and uh, and um, so if you look at audience agency data, which you'll all be far more familiar with than me, it suggests that in one or two wards in Bradford, that 100% of people are not engaged in culture because they don't buy a ticket at a box office. Now, we know that's nonsense because in aggregate, what happens in communities by way of culture is more, is far bigger as a set of transactions than um, that set of box office receipts, and it's far more sustainable. And so I think there is a conversation to be had about, you know, what is culture and what do we value as being culture? If all we're valuing is 
people who rock up to a box office and buy a ticket, that's you know, long lens. But as, if, as Amira says, you know, this, thing's, this stuff is happening everywhere, every day in people's homes and living rooms and parks. That's a different kind of ball game altogether. And so, you know, there is a conversation to be had about this. And that is important because it, it influences directly where resources go and who decides on, on how those resources are spent. Um, and that, I think, in the, in, the, in the kind of space of cultural democracy becomes a really important discussion. I, mean, I, I couldn't agree more. And, and uh, just to give an absolutely shameless plug, uh, myself, Mark Taylor and Orion Brook have just written a book precisely about uh, those those kinds of issues and, and the relationship with, you know, what do we count as culture? How do we measure it? And then where does it, you know, appear in uh, funders priorities? And, and, you know, not just in terms of money, but uh, as Amira was saying, you know, things like decisions about, well, can you have access to that public space? You know, could you use that, um, you know, unused shop front for a different purpose? Things that aren't purely financial, um, but do uh, depend very heavily on um, having a much more accurate description and understanding of what culture is. We, we've got four minutes left um, and, it, you know, I'm sort of a bit, a bit gutted about that because I, I think we could go much, much longer and, and there's a load more questions, but I just wonder um if sarah and, and nisha you might have any um kind of closing or, or concluding comments um whether on this you know particular thing about how society is changing or, or, or whether more generally um maybe if, if, if sarah you'd like to go first um yeah I th taking up on the point about cultural democracy um in our theater a third of our annual income comes from the pantomime, which is a month long event. Um, is that culture? I mean, to, yes, to the people of Newark, pantomime is an essential um, way that they engage with culture. Um, I think we need to think more broadly about what culture is and where it can go. And so this year, because of course, Panto was canceled, the whole town is devastated. Um, so instead we're gonna try and put on a Christmas event um, in the castle ground, so an outdoor event. We're just waiting to find out whether we're going to be allowed to do that or not. Um, and that's a way of getting our local community to participate in something as a community, so something that people can do together. So to my mind, this is us thinking differently about, as you say, museums without walls, culture without walls, taking it out and about around the community, finding ways that people can engage and participate um, without those kind of formal um, barriers that were perhaps there before. Um, so I think it is an exciting time for us. It's a time when we should be changing and experimenting and trying new things. And hopefully some of those will stick for the future. N Nisha, over to you. Yeah, I totally uh, agree with Sarah that it is time for us to be thinking about that every culture uh, should be valued and every culture has a different value and uh, participating and engaging with your own um, people and with others is very, very important and learning from each other. So I think leadership um, is very important in, in, uh, in, in, uh, the whole sector of arts and culture, and we need to show our leadership collectively um, and also uh, putting the resources and valuing each other's culture equally is very, very important. And that's what I take um, today from uh, everybody that we should value each other and value the most important thing in our lives is the culture um, and bring it out to, uh, to our societies and share. Wonderful. That, that is a, a perfect end, uh, I think. Um, and we've covered all, all kinds of, of, of different issues. Um, I can't remember if it's been or if it's later this week, uh, but there is an event specifically around those digital uh, practices and, and, and questions. Um, I, if, if it's been, it's been recorded. Um, and then um, otherwise, uh, I'd recommend you, you sign up to it. Um, so. I have like a tiny little bit of housekeeping, which is that links, slides, documents, et cetera, will be uh, sent round. Um, that there'll be, a, I guess, a kind of a follow-up email from the, uh, the center's team. Uh, there'll be a tiny little bit of chat uh, time for about kind of five or 10 minutes or so. 
Um, and you know, those of you who've opted in to share your details uh, will we'll have uh, access to um, follow-ups and, and, and a bit of networking. Um, and then if you could, um, is, is there a survey? Um, I, I should be better briefed on this, um, but if you can fill in the feedback form uh, that's in the chat now, um, you'll be in with a chance of winning a £50 uh, book voucher, um, which, which sounds great. Um, so, yeah, um, I mean, just thank you to the panel. Obviously, that, that was really great. Um, but also, actually, thank you to you, the audience, both um, for being part of the session, um, for taking the time to put questions in. Um, you, you know, it, it, it's always a bit of a wonder whether people are going um, to get engaged and um, where, where the conversations are going to happen. Uh, but it looks like reading the chat that they have. Um, so thanks very much. Thanks again and, uh, and take care. Thank you.